All right. So this is the last day of, of ordinary new material, and then I'm, on Monday I'll do a review of the semester, go, try to go over everything lightly and quickly. And today's topic will be musical instruments. And it's effectively a continuation of the, of the, the theme that's been going along with clocks. Clocks, as I told you last time, the timekeepers for clocks uh, are, you know, in all practical purpose cases, are, are harmonic oscillator systems that obey the rules of a harmonic oscillator, namely they have a stable equilibrium and the restoring force that acts on, on this inertial component uh, is proportional to how far it is away from equilibrium. So once you've got that, you've got a harmonic oscillator and the wonderful feature of a harmonic oscillator is the, the period is independent of the size of the oscillation, the amplitude of the oscillation. Okay, any questions about harmonic oscillator issues just to this point? I'm sorry, gonna be trying to be ambitious and get through a whole bunch of demonstrations uh, since it's the last opportunity to do that. So musical instruments are, are most of them built around harmonic oscillators again. Uh, the very fact that musical instruments can play loud and soft and still produce the same tones should be a sort of a giveaway that they have harmonic oscillator character to them. Uh, when you pluck the string of, a, of a, a guitar or violin, you get the same pitch whether you pluck it hard or pluck it soft. Um, when you blow into a flute, you get the same pitch whether you blow hard or soft. I mean, there, there are limits to some of these things. You can, you can get other things to happen. Uh, and those, uh, if you blow too hard into a flute or a recorder, maybe you've tried this, uh, it, it produces a different pitch. Something funny happens. And that's because the harmonic oscillators in musical instruments are more sophisticated, I, you know, just, just uh, essentially, the systems are more complicated than the, than the simple harmonic oscillators we've been dealing with in, in clocks. In a clock, for example, a pendulum clock, the harmonic oscillator consists of really one object. It only has one way it can move. It's the, it can go back and forth. That's all it can do. It's a single object. It has a single characteristic as a harmonic oscillator. Same with a mass bouncing on a spring. Same with the tuning fork going back and forth. Uh, what else? Uh, the, the balance ring. They're all one harmonic oscillator a simple inertial component, a simple restoring force component, that's it. With musical instruments, you're often dealing with a more complicated structure with many ways it can move. And an example of that is, is a string. And I've got a string up here, the strings on violins and guitars. And because a string has parts that can move independently of other parts, or at least not necessarily completely independently, but they can all move. There are lots of parts of the string that can move basically acts not as one harmonic oscillator, but as a whole set of harmonic oscillators. And that's true of strings. It's going to be true of the air inside a pipe. Uh, air, it turns out, can, you know, air can move. We've seen that. And air has inertia. And air experiences forces if you get the pressure out of balance. So it can, it can move around and cycle uh, in, 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 a, in a complex repetitive motions. But when you get air moving, because all the different parts of the air can move uh, to some extent independently, it's not just one harmonic oscillator, it's many. It's a collection of harmonic oscillators. So that's where I'm going to head, and I'll try to do it as sort of expeditiously as possible to get uh, through all the, as many of the demonstrations as I can. All right, so the, this, the opening question. If you tap a wine glass, it emits a characteristic tone that decays gradually away. And if you want to break that wine glass with sound, which we'll do later for sure, you want to choose a glass with what? You've got a couple choices. You can, have a, uh, you can have a glass that takes a long time for the sound to decay away, or that decays away very quickly. You know, thunk. So you get, you get the ping, or you get the thunk. Uh, so which one do you want? And what sort of sound do you want to expose that glass to? A, a brief loud sound, not super loud, but loud, or a steady tone that, in fact, by the word characteristic is a tone associated with the wine glass itself, the one you heard when you pinged it. You okay with the question? How many think that you want a glass with a long decay and sing at it at its, at its favorite uh, pitch, the pitch you get when you ting it? How many think B, C, or D? <laughs> Sorry. B, 
being quick here. No, OK, it's A. Um, yes, you can, you can break glass with an incredibly loud sound. And explosions, of course, break, will break any old glass. And that's equivalent to just, you can get a harmonic oscillator going by just smacking it. Any old harmonic oscillator, you hit it hard enough, it's going to start going. But by singing at the characteristic tone of the glass, which is what we'll do, you're doing, you're doing the trick of, of, of pushing it a little bit each time it goes away from you. You're gradually transferring energy into it. And because it holds on to that energy well, that is, it doesn't decay away, its, its own sound doesn't decay away quickly, it's good at holding on to energy. And you can keep adding and keep adding and keep adding. You have to be very careful about how you add. If you add at the wrong moment, if you push at the wrong moment, you take energy out. But if you do it right, you can get the energy in more and more and more until finally the glass breaks. So you see in sort of video types or, or cartoony type people breaking glasses, breaking glass with pitches or non-pitches or you know, sounds and any old glass, people breaking glass, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're Eyeglasses and something. No, that's all nonsense. Um, yes, you can break eyeglasses with a really loud sound. Most eyeglasses these days are not glass anyway. They're plastic that doesn't break well. Uh, that, that, anyway, I'll stop with that. But, but the, the real circumstance in which you can break glass with sound and with a human voice is a wine glass that holds, gla holds sound really well, that holds the energy really well, and sing at it at its characteristic frequency. Even so, there are only a few people that have ever managed to do this. I mean, some of the, the famous opera singers, Caruso supposedly could do this, could actually hold a glass and sing at it loudly and on the correct tone enough to, to break the glass. I wonder whether he wear, wore a face mask while he was doing that. OK, so some observations about musical instruments. Got, they, they produce different notes, and associated with those different notes are different frequencies of the sound. I won't go into great detail about how sound works, but you know that you've heard different pitches. I mean, last night there were a thousand, you know, all the acapella people singing at the, at Lighting a Lawn, all the different pitches, uh, these are associated with different frequencies of something rhythmically moving. It's actually air, air itself can support all sorts of uh, uh, vibrational motions, and it behaves as a vast variety of harmonic oscillators yet again. But the, the, the main point here is that we hear the frequency of things moving rhythmically as, as the pitches of those sounds. That's how we, we uh, take them in through our ears and our brains. So uh, musical instruments can predict, produce different notes, meaning they can, vibe, they can have things going through rhythmic motions with different frequencies. Again, the reciprocal of period. Um, they can be tuned to produce the right notes. You know, they're not usually can just constructed and, and they're ready to go. You have to adjust them to give the, the correct notes. And when you're doing that, you are playing with the inertial components. You are playing with the restoring force. You're trying to get them to be just right to give you the right rhythm to the motion. Um, the different instruments sound different even when they're playing the same note. That turns out because the motions that occur in musical instruments are not those of a single harmonic oscillator going through its single motion. They're actually multiple harmonic oscillators, which have different frequencies, different ways they go through the motion. And that gives you sort of nuance to the sounds that you hear. You're not just hearing a single harmonic oscillator going through its rhythm. You're hearing a collection of harmonic oscillators going through their individual rhythms. And finally, creating, uh, creating the motions and Subsequently, the, the sounds that come out of musical instruments requires energy. So somewhere the energy goes into something, getting it going through its rhythmic motion, which then causes sound to be launched off, which is itself not a trivial task. Just because something is going through a rhythmic motion doesn't mean that you can hear it. So a whole bunch of questions that I could possibly go through. Probably I won't get all of them. It would be a miracle if I did, but I'll, but I'll go after a few of them. So the first one is to look at a string. And to say, why does a, a, a taut string, if you pluck a taut string, and, ta and taut is, is, means there's tension in it. One end's being pulled, say, to your left, and the other is to pull to your right. The string becomes taut. It has tension in it. Um, 
and it, and it will begin to, it, it's capable now of vibrating in interesting ways. If there's no tension in it, it, does, it has no restoring force. The tension is, is part and parcel, well, it's, it's a major com contributor to restoring force. So just, if you just think about a string, so here you got a string here, stretch from left to right, uh, gravity's around causing a little bit of a sag to the string, but, but neglecting that, if, if you put enough tension in the string, it barely, gravity has basically no important role in the story. It's basically just a string being pulled to the left at one end, to the right at the other end, and the result is you have created a system that has a stable equilibrium. The string returns to this orientation, namely a straight line, again, neglecting gravity, when you leave it alone and let, get rid of all of its extra energy. It takes energy to pull it away from straight. I can show you, grab it and push down on it. I'll do work on it in that process. It will now no longer be straight, okay? So, so taking it away from the equilibrium requires energy. And it's, it's starting to sound like it might be a harmonic oscillator. It's a system with a stable equilibrium. And, okay, that's the first requ requirement. The next requirement is that it needs to have a restoring force that is proportional to how far you've taken it away from equilibrium. Well, if I just take a little piece of it away from equilibrium, you can't, I can't guarantee that the restoring force is going to be exactly proportional to how far I take it away. Because I can have other parts pulled in different ways. I can, I can, five of us could go and pull in different ways on that string and make a mess of it. It would be all distorted in various ways. And the, the forces that each of us would be experiencing might not be exactly proportional to how far our particular part is away from straight. So um, it's not looking good for being a harmonic oscillator. Well, the solution to this, do you understand the problem that if, 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 if all of you pull down on this string and I go to one piece of the string and pull up on it, the restoring force that I'm experiencing is going to be away from equilibrium because I'm, I'm the, the holdout pulling the wrong way. My portion of the string is going to want to join the other portions of the string farther away. So it doesn't look like it's a harmonic oscillator. The solution to this is that there are certain ways in which a string can, can move as a whole that fulfill the requirement of being a harmonic oscillator. If the whole string bows up, then at, with a the right shape to it, then it experiences, each portion experiences a restoring force back to straight that really is proportional to how far away from center it is, from straight. And if you go farther, twice, twice as far away, it's, every part's going to be pulled twice as far. It works out. There is a mode in which the system can move that has the right requirements of a harmonic oscillator and therefore has a frequency of oscillation that's independent of, of its motion. So it's not that, the, that each part of the string is a harmonic oscillator. It's the whole string has a mode of motion that is a harmonic oscillator. It's kind of an abstract notion, but I can show it to you. So I, I am going to get the string bouncing, not by, with my hands, but by rhythmically shaking one end of it. Hope, this thing's always a little bit iffy. I have to shake it the right, there it is. Uh, if, I, if, if we shake it the wrong, frequ wrong frequency, the energy goes in and the energy comes out because we, we got to keep doing what, there it is. It, 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 that, that bow shape, if I can get it to, that's the harmonic oscillator motion. It's, big in this case, but we can make it small, we can make it bigger. It's, it's that, it has a very specific rhythm, and throughout this motion, the force back towards straight is proportional to how far it is from straight. Is that okay? That's called the fundamental vibrational mode of this string. Here's the drawing of it. It has a, a simple structure, it's this arc, it happens to be, to be related to, to trigonometric functions. It's, it's a sine, it's sinus. It, if this is x, this is sine x. Um, and it goes from, from uh, you know, zero to zero, and in the middle is, is the biggest motion, uh, just like sine goes from zero to zero through one uh, as you go 
across the angles. Um, there are names for the parts of the motion. The ends of the, uh, of the string, which do not move up and down, are called nodes. It's just the name that they, was chosen. And the middle that moves the most is called an antinode. So the, the places with the largest uh, overall motion are the antinodes. And in the case of the, what's called the fundamental vibrational mode of a string, it has others, which I'll show you. Uh, there's, there are two nodes at the end, and there's the antinode in the middle. Uh, when you pluck a violin string, this is the main motion that occurs to it, occurs with it. So if I just, you know, my, my, the world's cheapest violin here, um, it probably involved labor that I do not want to know about. Um, when, I, when, I'm, when I pluck it like this, particularly the middle, I'm getting primarily that motion in, in the string. Uh, it, it's, it's so fast you can't see it going back and forth, but you, but you, can, you can hear that the motion is occurring. Uh, what else to say about this? So, is, you okay with that, the idea? Uh, I, should, I guess I should, say, I should say what determines how fast it goes through its cycle. The fact that it's got tension in it means that it wants to be back at equilibrium, the string does. And when you take it away, it keeps fighting to go there. It keeps coasting through equilibrium out the other side and then turning around, coming back, and so on. The, the, the frequency of its motion, again, the inverse of its period, depends on its inertial uh, aspect and on its restoring force aspect. The more inertia it has, the slower things will go. So for example, if you change the string, make it more massive, the details of, of Okay, you add mass to it, um, make the string thicker, put extra stuff on it. That will slow down the motion because there's more inertia for the same restoring force. And it's just going to have a tougher time turning around, coming back, turning around, coming back. Should be pretty straightforward. Uh, you can, so you can lower the pitch of a string by making it thicker. And for those of you who ever played a stringed instrument, including a piano, the thicker the string is, the lower its pitch is, all else being approximately unchanged. Another thing you can do to a string to make it, uh, to, to change its pitch, make it t tighter, more tension. Turn the tuning peg or adjustment to really pull harder on that string. You stiffen the restoring force. It fights harder to be back at center. That speeds up the motion. It's trying to go through its rhythm. Uh, it's got the, the inertia gets, the inertial part gets pulled back towards center more aggressively by this restoring force. So cranking up the tension of a string inevitably raises its pitch, increases its frequency. The last thing you can do is you can shorten the string. As you make the string st shorter and shorter, it, 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 the center cares more about being away from center. The, the middle of the string cares more about, uh, about being away from equilibrium. It fights harder to get back. So shorter strings are, become higher pitch. And you can see that in a violin. Uh, you know, again, the world's cheapest here. The, 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 the thickest string is the lowest pitch string. The tensions are about equal. I haven't played with this for ages. I'm not a violinist. So, that, so, so that's low pitch. The, the thin, skinny string, much higher pitch. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, in all these stringed instruments, the low pitch strings are the more massive ones. Mass slows things down. The higher pitch ones, the least massive. You can change the pitch of any given string just by in adjusting its tension. And people, you know, people do that in the process of tuning up before a concert. You would adjust all the tensions to get them just right to give you the right pitch for all the strings. And the last thing you can do is you can play with the length of the string. And you don't actually have to cut the string up and whatever. You just have to move the node. The node normally is, is at the two points where the string touches the instrument. There's one here, and there's one there. Same with a guitar. And if you begin to bring the node, close, the, the, the node closer, this node and, uh, closer, by pinching it against the fingerboard here, the pitch goes up. Okay? You're, when you do that, when you shorten the string, you are both reducing its overall mass and you are stiffening the restoring force by shortening it. 
making it, making it harder to take it away from center. So this is sort of the brief in, uh, examination of, of strings and string vibrations and their fundamental vibration. Questions about any of that? So strings don't have to, to uh, the, the details of, of how much the pitch changes and stuff, eh, leave that for another semester. Because the string is this extended object with many p possible moving parts, all the individual segments of string, it, it does have the capacity to vibrate not just as one harmonic oscillator, but as more than one, several, many in principle, an infinite number, or at least as many as there are atoms in the string. Uh, in practice, only a, a few of them matter. But in it, so in addition to the fundamental vibrational mode, where the string goes up and down as one arc, and fulfills the requirements of a harmonic oscillator, having a restoring force proportional to displacement, it can vibrate as two half strings, or three one-third strings. And I'll, I'll try to show you those. So there's the fundamental again. And if I go twice as fast, and it's really, it should be exactly twice as fast. There it is. That's what's known as the second harmonic. There, there is no first harmonic, it's, it is the fundamental. That's the second harmonic, where the string is vibrating as two half strings. And this string now has an extra node in the middle that is a point that doesn't move, and it, you, gotta hit, you gotta hit the frequency right or, or we lose it. Uh-oh, there it is. So it's, it's got an extra node. It's also got two anti-nodes, not one. It's got two. It's vibrating as though it were two strings of half the original length. I'm having trouble getting it. It could just, we could get this exact, it's like the fundamental mode of a, of a string half the length of the original. And it occurs at twice the frequency of the fundamental. We hear, when, we, when you listen to music, ah. When you listen to music, so, t tones that are separated by one, by, by, by a factor of two in frequency, are separated on, on the keyboard or in, in musical instrument by, by one octave. So those of you who know music, you, you've heard pitches that, that differ by one octave. They differ by, one, by a factor of two in frequency. And so that, so, you know, moreover, Octave space tones sound very, very similar to our ears. And when people sing in unison, typically male voices and female voices are separated uh, in by, by one or two octaves. So an octave is ba, ba, ah, that's two, second octave. You know. <laughs> All right. So um, those, two, those two motions there, if they were suitable for, for creating uh, music, they would differ by one octave. So a string vibrates at its fundamental at one pitch, and when it vibrates in its uh, second harmonic, it vibrates one octave above its fundamental pitch. Sounds, th those two sounds go very well together. We hear them as, as a richer version of the original sound if they're, if they're both present at once. Is that okay? Um, third harmonic. There, there's second. There's the third harmonic. The third harmonic occurs at three times the, the frequency or pitch of the fundamental. And that, for music, is a, is a, is a major fifth. So, so the fundamental will be ba, the, the octave will be ba, ba, and then the fifth will be mm, ba. I may have done, add an extra octave in there, but ba, ba. Okay? <laughs> I can go in a cappella group too. All right. Um, been a while. All right. So, so this continues. Actually, the, the major fifth also sounds good with the one octave and the, uh, the fundamental. So they all work together in music beautifully. Uh, the fourth harmonic, which I'll get here, is two octaves above the fundamental. It's four times the frequency. There's fourth harmonic. And you can keep going. Fifth, fifth harmonic, 
sixth harmonic. All right. <laughs> ah, ramming speed. Okay, so, so the strings can vibrate in many different ways, and depending on how the, the motion is initiated, you get often more than one at once. So here we're trying to get just one motion at once, but amazingly enough, the, the second harmonic motion, that two half strings, and the fundamental, one single string, and all the other pieces, they can coexist on the same string at the same time. It's, they're still harmonic oscillators. They still fulfill the requirement of, uh, the, uh, of restoring force, and they have their own pitches that don't depend on amplitude. And the mixture of those different motions simultaneously contribute to the richness of the sound of many stringed instruments. They're not only emitting one pitch, but they have superposed on that the, the octave, that's the second harmonic, the octave and a fifth, that's the third harmonic. The second octave, that's the fourth harmonic. Okay? So, anything else I want to do with these demos? Okay. So, so that, that handles strings pretty nicely by themselves. It brings then to the question of how do you get the string going? And I, where do I want to do this? Okay, so this this. To get a pendulum swinging vigorously by giving it a series of small pushes, you should push it each time Push it away from me each time it is. What, what is it? What do you want it to be doing when you give it a push? How many things do you want it to be to push it when it's as close as possible to you? You're trying to add energy. How about when it's as far as possible from you? How about when it's moving toward you? How about when it's moving away from you? Yay! So when are you moving when it's moving away from you? And the point of, of, of asking this question is, probably the next slide will is. You can get a string vibrating in, in two extremely, two very different ways. You can pluck it, which is what I've been doing up until now. So you, so you pull it away from center, do a lot of work on it at once, and then just let her rip. And boom, 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 back and forth it goes. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility is to rhythmically push it in sync with its own motion. And that is like the bowling ball over here, this idea that that I can either give it one big smack, or I can rhythmically push it as it moves away from me, each time. And what a bow does in stringed instruments is it automatically pushes the string in sync with its own motion. Uh, it's, it's a peculiarity of horsehair and, and rosin, basically a, sort of a tree sap, that manages to get a slip stick effect. It, it grabs and then it and pushes, and then it releases, and then it grabs and pushes and releases. And you can get a bowing effect. I can do it, you know, I, I have a terrible time getting it to work properly with, um, with a violin bow, but I can do it with water and a glass. Here's the water. Here's the water. Here's the water, okay. My memories of going to, fancy restaurants as a kid. You, you know this trick? You can't do this easily with a water glass. You need a glass that, that stores energy well. And good wine glasses store energy well. And I'm bowing it. It's the same as a violin bow. There's a stick slip effect with my finger, grabbing, pushing, letting go, grabbing, pushing, letting go, rhythmically. And it causes energy to go into the motion and get stronger and stronger. I did it last time with that long aluminum bar. I bowed it. I, I pulled on it, stick slip. I had rosin on my fingers. And, it, and they're not horse hair, but, they're, but it works anyway. And, and rhythmically put the energy in. So the difference in sound between these uh, two, two ways of putting energy in a string are a plucked string starts at its loudest and gets gradually softer because there's, no, there's a lot of energy put in it once and then it decays away. And that is a type of, of sound envelope that we can hear and you can say, oh, that's a plucked string. You, 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 you know it, you've heard it before, you identify it easily. The alternative is a bowed string starts soft and gets louder as the bowing commences. 
because the energy is going in and accumulating more and more and more, and then it's sustained if it's bowed properly, which I can never do. Okay? So part of what we hear in musical instruments is the envelope, it's called, of the sound, the rises and falls in its volume, the structure of that. Now, as far as is the idea of adding energy to things rhythmically, uh, this brings up the whole idea of, of what's called sympathetic vibration. The last item in here is that, is that the bow deliberately puts energy in at, the, at this characteristic frequency. It, it, it's, pu it's pushing in sync with the motion of the, of the harmonic oscillator. Uh, in general, this, this sort of arrangement is known as sympathetic vibration, where you have one system rhythmically moving, going through its motion, at the same frequency as another object that could go through that same motion. And there, if, there, if those two systems, one, one rhythmically moving and one incapable of moving but not doing it yet, if they are able to, to talk to each other by way of forces and torques, energy will move from the first one to the second one. And uh, the, the, the laboratory demonstration of this is these two pendula, two, they're two identical pendulums. Like I could, if I unclip them and swung, one, swung the other, actually, let me do that, okay, I'll do it. These guys should be, should be very nicely synced. They should just back and forth, they're the same. And right now, there's nothing much connecting one to the other. But let me add a little bit of a connection. There we go. Just a little limp spring. And let me get one of them moving and not the other. Now, that spring is carrying a little bit of a push-pull over to the second one and getting it moving. And because it's able to move at the same frequency, it gets moving a lot. It sucks all the energy out of the first one. They're actually playing back and forth with the energy. This one's going to come to almost a stop. That one's got all the energy. And now the energy's working its way over. That one's coming to a stop. And that one's got all the energy. You can see the energy's going back and forth because the two objects have the same natural rhythm, and, and they just rhythmically pass the energy back and forth. So this sort of thing happens, it ha it'll happen in sort of any musical environment where you've got many instruments around and some of them are playing and some of them are not. If, if somebody's playing their guitar on, on, on they, they pluck a G, a certain G note, another guitar nearby that is capable of emitting that same note will begin to vibrate a little bit by way of sympathetic vibration. You, you've seen this sort of effect just in general, when you're, you're playing your, your sound system and you, you, things around the room begin to buzz and, and vibrate, surely you've, you've, you've noticed this sort of thing happen. It's, it's that sympathetic vibration where one thing vibrating causes the other one to vibrate. Energy is being transferred from one to the other. Is that, is that familiar sort of effect? Uh, having said that, then I can show you various examples of it. This example, again, a sort of a laboratory one. Yeah, too many. Th These are two identical tuning forks. They happen to sit on boxes for a reason that is, and I'll take a, a brief excursion here, that tuning forks and other thin objects are not very good at launching sound. Strings, for example, are, are, are terrible at launching sound. Why? Because sound consists of fluctuations in pressure in the air for it to propagate along. In order to get the air to, be, to go up in pressure or down in pressure, you have to squish it. You have to squish the air to, to go up in pressure. You have to unsquish it to, make it to get it down in pressure. And a string just whizzing back and forth, thin, skinny little guy, has a terrible time squishing the air. It would be like trying to clap your fingers instead of clap. You, know, you clap your hand, right? because you've got a big surface to work with and really catch the air's attention. But a little, a little finger clapping, you can't do it so easily. The air, the air laughs at you and scoots around your finger each time it moves. It's too thin. So to get the air and squish it, whether you've got another object to work with or not, speakers, their surfaces, they really can sort of jump at the air and, and squish it, jump away from the air and un unsquish it. Does that sort of make sense? And the, uh, a way to show you this is this is a music box without the box. 
and it plays a familiar, a familiar tone sound. Off to where we go. But it's really slow. I don't know why it's so slow today. Okay, anyway, the box matters. This, this guy is not a stringed instrument. It's an instrument with little teeny tines that vibrate up and down. But they're skinny. They can't get the, er the air's attention. The air just scoots around them each time they move. So they don't manage to compress or rarefy the air well. They don't launch sound well. To launch sound, you want something that the air can't scoot around, a surface. So this guy is almost silent without a surface, just like a string is almost silent without a surface. But if you put it on a, can you hear it? That's what the violin's box is doing. The strings vibrating create almost no sound. It's the, the uh, in fact, the sympathetic vibration of the, of the surface with the strings that allows the violin to project sound. Is that okay? Yeah, the table will do it too, but not as, you know. And hopefully it'll run down soon. So that's why the boxes are here. The, the, the tuning forks by themselves, terrible at launching sound. Okay, they have the same pitch, these guys. Okay, they're both stopped. I, I suck the energy out by playing shock absorber here, my fit hands. So that guy is silent. Nothing going on here. I'm going to hit this guy. Can you hear this going? So I didn't, I didn't smack it. I smacked this guy, and by way of the sound between them, they transferred energy from one to the other. Okay? So, that brings us to, yep, transferring energy from one wine glass to another. Well, getting two identical wine glasses is a little tricky. Getting them right on the same pitch, uh, you have to pick like crazy through uh, thousands of glasses to find a pair. But we can, we can create sound electronically with a speaker and sing at a wine glass and cause it to begin vibrating at its, in its fundamental mode. Its fundamental mode, incidentally, of a wine glass is if you look down on the wine glass, which we'll do now, we are looking down at a wine glass. Which wine glass? Ah, this one. Hi. OK? You're looking down at that wine glass. And its fundamental vibrational mode, it's not a string, is for its lip to go from round to, to, to uh, oblong one way, or elliptical one way, to elliptical the other. It's going to go back and forth th like this. Now, when you just tap it with your finger, the back and forth motion is so dinky you can't see it. But we're going to sing at it, and we're going to make that motion begin to accumulate energy until it's moving so much that you'll be able to see it. And in fact, so much that it will break. Is that okay? So to do this, we got a, the source of a, a, of a specific pitch electronically and a, a, a weird speaker, a piece of a speaker here that will sing very loudly, obnoxiously loudly at that glass. And it's really obnoxious for me. Um, and there's a, there's a strobe here that will try to illuminate the glass at the right moment so that you can see its, its wacky shape. All right? And we got to get the frequency just right. The frequency isn't quite right, probably. It's, oh! It was right. As you would have noticed, I'm not going to break another one. Um, you may, not, may or may not have been able to see the, the, the oblong shape. Uh, it, some of these, sometimes we, 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 we fail to break it at all, 
and have to go to another glass, which is why we've got a, a fleet of them there. You can't like test it in advance. Oh, it broke, it's great, yeah, we can use it. Um, so you, you just take potluck, and this one was really easy to break. Uh, so nothing touched it. Just the air rhythmically pushing on it caused it to begin moving more and more aggressively until it finally self-destructed. Is that okay with everybody? Another case of this sort of thing where, where and here we were singing at it to get it going. In principle, if I rubbed it, my finger around it properly and bowed it, I could get it going to the point where it would break, but never, that, you know, I cut my fingers, I won't do it. Um, another case where something bowed another object, by bowing, it's much my generic term for this, this uh, stick slip type effect that rhythmically puts energy in at the preferred frequency of the motion. Uh, another case where this happened is now an old story of a, of a bridge in Tacoma, Washington. You may have seen this before. Is this going to work here? Let's try this. And I got to do. I saw the Tacoma Narrows Bridge die today, and only by the grace of God escaped dying with it. I have been near death many times in my life, but not even in my worst experiences in France did I know the feeling of helpless horror that gripped me when I was trapped on the bridge this morning. The Olympic Peninsula, extending northward from the lower end of Puget Sound for a distance of more than 90 miles, is separated from the mainland throughout its length by the waters of the Sound. At its narrowest point, Tacoma Narrows, the width of the Sound is 4,600 feet. In 1937, the state of Washington created a toll bridge authority, which was empowered to construct bridges within the state. By June 1938, an amount of $6,400,000 to build the bridge across Tacoma Narrows was secured. Construction started in January 1939. The plans called for a suspension bridge having a central span of 2,800 feet and two side spans of 1,100 feet each. The structure of a two-lane roadway with two sidewalks was supported by two cables 39 feet apart and by stiffening I-beam girders eight feet tall. Each of the two main cables is made up of many strands of iron wire. The cables terminate at each end of the bridge in concrete anchorages. The Tacoma Narrow Suspension Bridge was ready to be opened for vehicular traffic on July 1, 1940. After the usual ribbon-cutting ceremony and speeches, the official motorcade crossed the bridge from the mainland to the peninsula. After the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was open to traffic, its unusual behavior was noted by a number of motorists. This behavior was described by an engineer associated with the bridge project. Immediately after the bridge was put into service, many motorists who crossed it commented on the extraordinary oscillations of the roadway. These oscillations, or waves, were sufficient to cause discomfort to occupants of cars, and some motorists made long detours to avoid recrossing the bridge. The oscillations were in a vertical direction, some having up and down motion as large as five feet. The amount of up and down motion did not seem to depend on the wind speed. It seemed wise to us to make a systematic series of observations of the oscillations of the bridge. We observed, first, motions of considerable magnitude with wind velocities as low as three or four miles per hour. And second, the violence of motion was not proportional to the velocity of wind. On November 7, 1940, at 5 a.m., Mr. Kenneth Arkin, chairman, Washington Tollbridge Authority, was awakened by the wind. I got up and drove to the Narrows Bridge to check it. I went to mid-span and measured the velocity of the wind to be 38 miles per hour. The bridge bounce was noticeable, but of no great magnitude. Hurrying back to the observation house, I encountered Mr. Farquharson, our consulting engineer. While Ken Arkin was at the observation house, I went to a position on the axis of the bridge to photograph its motion. Suddenly, a motion of catastrophic proportions developed. As quickly as possible, I reached a station just outside the tower to photograph the motion of the bridge. It was quite impossible to operate a camera on the main span, so violent was its motion. I had climbed to the observation house and looked through the transit. 
Suddenly, the mid-span disappeared from my vision. The mid-span seemed to have blown north approximately half the roadway width, coming back into position with a twisting motion. I yelled to have the traffic across the bridge stopped. Turning back to the transit, I noticed the twisting motion increased to great proportions. I could not keep the light poles in my line of vision long enough to determine their exact motions. I then saw a car parked beyond the tower on the right side of the roadway. I noticed it suddenly careened to the left side of the road. The driver fell out, grabbed the curb, and hung on for what appeared to be several minutes. The bridge calmed down sufficiently for him to struggle in. As a reporter on the Tacoma News Tribune staff, I had gone to watch the bridge. I drove onto the bridge and started across. In the car with me was my daughter's cocker spaniel, Tubby. Not until I reached the first towers did I realize that something was terribly wrong. Just as I drove past the towers, the bridge began to sway violently from side to side. The tilt from side to side became so violent that I lost control of the car. I jammed on the brakes and got out of the car, only to be thrown onto my face against the curb. Around me, I could hear concrete cracking. I started back to the car to get the dog, but I was thrown before I could reach it. The car itself began to slide from side to side on the roadway. I decided the bridge was breaking up. My only hope was to get back to shore. I crawled 500 yards or more to the towers. My knees were raw and bruised. My hands were swollen from gripping the concrete curb. But I was spurred on by the thought that if I could reach the towers, I would be safe. I made an effort during a momentary decrease in the violence of the bridge motion to reach the car. But the car began to shift about in a most alarming manner. While I was out on this portion of the span, I took the opportunity to examine the state of the bridge. As far as the eye and ear could detect, the oscillator is to throw me violently to the deck. Yeah. Successive unloading of the main span it producing a corresponding broke. shock in the side span from which I was attempting to make observations. It, it, it finally breaks, of course, and alas, Tubby is no more. I, the saddest part of the story. So, I, but I, want, I want to show you one more set of demonstrations before I stop. And, and so, so this is a case, the wind effectively bowed the bridge, like played it like a musical instrument to the point where it actually self-destructed. I just want to show you the vibrating columns of, of air. And you've seen or you know, musical instruments that are, the wind instruments all have air vibrating. Um, this is a simple wind instrument. And by blowing across it, I'm actually bowing it Again, according to my, my concept of rhythmically adding energy, the air that I blow across the lip is ultimately being pushed out of the bottle by the, by the vibrating air column and into the bottle by the vibrating air column. And so I'm adding energy to it. And if I, if I change the gas in this to a gas with less inertia, namely helium, the pitch. Could you hear the swoop? Well, the helium stays in it, which is not very long. The pitch goes up because the mass is less. Lower the inertia, you get a faster vibration. Any opportunity to use helium is fun. All right. Last thing to show you. Hopefully that makes some sense. I, I'm violating my rules of doing demonstrations without necessarily explaining them well. If I take a very long column of air, it's got a lot of mass. It's got a relatively soft restoring force because you can take the, the pressure of the center of a portion of uh, center of a, col a long column away from atmospheric pressure and not have a very big difference in pressure between the gradient in pressure between the atmospheric here and high pressure or low pressure there. It's not. It's, it's got a long area to, to move. I I could in principle get that going by doing this, but it's not going to work. So I use a trick that involves a burner. Oh, come on. That guy doesn't want to do anything. That's boring. All right. That's the air column going. Of course, I'm blowing, blowing out the. 
So that was, that was a long column. Let's go to really long column. The longer the column, more mass, softer restoring force, lower pitch. <laughs> So, those, so air columns can vibrate, too. They have pitches that depend on their length, by and large. They can also vibrate in harmonic modes. So this is another column. I can bow this, not with my mouth, but by whisking it through the air quickly. That's basically blowing across it, and the air goes in or out and out rhythmically. That's probably the, the fundamental is probably lower. I, what I want to show you is the harmonics. When I, when I get the harmonics, these guys, these are, these are like pitches related to like a, how a bugle works. Um, the, column, the air column is vibrating not as a single air column, but as a bunch of, of pieces moving opposite each other. And so if you've ever heard somebody playing a bugle, which has no adjustments for its pitch, it's got a, a single pipe but yet they can play different notes. They're playing different harmonics. They're getting the, the air column inside it vibrating in different ways. All right, I'll call it a day. Thanks for sticking around and uh, got through most of the toys here.